Hi. Um, I've probably touched on this subject before, but I think it's um, I think it's one of those things that is always timely because it's always out there. Um, and I want to talk about conspiracy theories now. Of course, this covers a very, very broad um, definition. So um, I'm not going to be focusing in depth in any particular conspiracy theory that is out there, but let's just break it down a little bit what the basic idea of a conspiracy theory is. And in the most basic form, it is basically that... I think I'm trying to get some sort of record for how many times I can say basically in one video. Yeah. Um, it's in the most pure form, it's really just about questioning the official version of things, the profound big events. So we all know that there are well-known historic events that do have a significant amount of counter arguments or counter ideas to the narrative of what really happened. Um, and the one to get the most attention, you know, they're in the cyber domain, they're in books, they are in um, speeches, that they are sometimes even the subject of films. Um, I mean, you get prominent film directors like Oliver Stone, who are, I cite him as an example, there's probably others, but they can definitely popularise some of these ideas. Oliver Stone's JFK is a good example of this although the film had uh, more than a few mistakes. Um, but the point is that conspiracy theories, for all that they pertain to be outside the box, they can actually get quite popular. Um, I mean, there's certainly well-known ones. Um, off the top of my head, perhaps some of the best known of the 20th century, chronologically speaking, would be the sinking of the Titanic, um, the Kennedy assassinations, plural, both assassinations of both brothers, both have conspiracy theories, particularly of President Kennedy, but also to a slightly lesser extent of his brother, but there are an increasing number of conspiracy theories about Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy's death. Um, the moon landing is of course a well-known one, um, that is, it never really happened or it wasn't officially as reported. Um, uh, a well-known one in the UK is the death of Princess Diana. Um, often they're involving serious events. And then, of course, um, in this century, the September 11th attacks. Um, in Britain, we've also had conspiracy theories around the London bombings. Uh, those are just some of the well-known ones off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure there's many others, um, but those are some of the better known ones. Um, they almost always involve serious events involving catastrophic loss of life or some big disaster or tragedy. Um, sometimes they're a bit more ridiculous. For example, the Paul is dead one, the theory that Paul McCartney of the Beatles actually died in 1966 and was replaced by a double. All I can say to that is, well, in that case, the double was very good, you know, because he produced some of the, helped to produce some of the Beatles' best stuff. Um, but, you know, there's also conspiracy theories that are more localised. Um, for example, the conspiracy theory in Rwanda that um, the Tutsis were responsible for killing President Habyarimana. Uh, who died along with the Burundian president, um, and the theory is that the Tutsi shot down his plane. Uh, to this day, there's still not conclusive evidence of what, what exactly happened in that um, incident. But regardless, whether it was fact-based or not, the Hutu extremists used that as an excuse. They said that the Tutsis killed their president under the false guise of a peace agreement um, at the Arusha Accords in Tanzania. Um, he was flying on the way there with the Burundian president and um, something went wrong. The plane either had a technical problem or was shot down. Still not certain exactly what happened. Regardless, it was used as one of the fuels for the genocide that followed. And in that incident, the radio played a profound role. In fact, never in human history 
has a radio station been so bloodstained? Recently, I found out that one of the Jenna Sigeries, um, who was actually tried in The Hague, um, was not what I thought from his voice. Um, he was actually a white European guy of, I believe, Italian or Belgian descent. Um, he was actually broadcasting in Hutu Power Radio. This was a man who uh, I forget his name off the top of my head, George, George something, but he was actually broadcasting hateful messages um, in the local language. Uh, he claimed ignorance, but um, regardless, he was tried and he did serve some prison time. Many said no, nowhere near enough for the thousands of deaths he helped to create. Um, almost always when we think about war, uh, particularly war involving major powers like the United States, it will be conspiracy theories attached. Um, and we've seen that with Iraq, with Syria. I mean, in the case of Iraq, one of the most sort of persistent ones is, well, the British and Americans just went in for oil. Now, this is an example of a conspiracy theory that will have um, not be entirely wrong. There will be factors of that that is true, but it also isn't the whole picture. But anyway, um, I don't want to get so much into individual conspiracy theories because, you know, there's plenty of ground for that. I want to talk more about, as I see it, the psychology of conspiracy theories and why, in my opinion, they can be very dangerous. Well, I've already pointed that out with the Rwandan genocide. Uh, the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, was also largely fueled by anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, that goes without saying. You know, there were popular anti-Semitic documents like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which the uh, Nazis fully endorsed. Um, and it wasn't one thing, there was obviously a string of factors leading up to the Holocaust. What we're seeing in China today, and I do intend to make a video about that because it's a very grave situation in Xinjiang, has a lot of chilling echoes of what happened in the 1930s. Um, but there are certain things that I notice with conspiracy theorists. Um, but I, I guess I should make a disclaimer. I probably should have said this at the start of the video, but I, uh, it is not my position. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me here. I am not saying that everyone who questions the official version of events is some crazy conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying that. I actually think it is healthy to question um, authority. I think it's healthy to question powerful media outlets, I think it's healthy to show dissent. And indeed, in free societies and democracies, that is not only healthy, it's important. So I wouldn't, for example, vilify someone as a conspiracy lunatic just because they ask questions of the official event in of itself. Um, where I do have a problem, though, and where I feel it becomes problematic is when conspiracy theorists will see everything, everything as a conspiracy. You can literally show them facts. You can literally show them evidence. And they will be so entrenched by the view that it's all part of the New World Order or the government or whatever, whatever it is they see things as they will convince themselves that that's the official version. So no matter what information is provided to them, no matter what information you're showing them, they have already got a confirmation bias that everything, everything is a conspiracy theory. There was a series presented by Jesse Ventura, the former governor of Minnesota and former professional wrestler. Um, it was an interesting series, it was quite entertaining. I had mixed views on it. I found um, Ventura a bit arrogant because he kind of played up his tough guy role and he used to do things like say, are you going to refuse a former governor entrance and stuff? And the problem with that show was it was a bit sensationalist. Um, and a lot of the things that they were talking about, they were not presenting the whole picture to it. But even Jesse Ventura questioned some of the more outlandish ones. For example, the reptilian shapeshifter nonsense that has been promoted by David Icke. Now, the thing is, it's um, it's easy to dismiss conspiracy theorists, but what's not so funny is some of these guys 
and they're often men, but not always, women as well. I've just come across one such person, and she was actively saying that everything bad we're hearing about China is just part of the Americans' plot to keep their power. So it's all made up, you know. Um, but what what these guys, um, people like David Icke, and uh, an example I would cite is Alex Jones. It's easy to dismiss them, but they actually do have a lot of support. That's what I find particularly troubling. Um, because it shows a few things. It shows that there is absolute disillusionment with um, mainstream media. And that's understandable. Often I feel disillusioned in mainstream media. But someone like Alex Jones, no matter how insane his ideas, no matter how outrageous, there there are some people who laugh at him. But there are many others who really, really do endorse his way of thinking. So, for example, when Alex Jones, um, and he wasn't the only one, there were others too, pushed the idea that teenagers and children who'd survived mass shootings, such as Sandy Hook, um, were crisis actors. Now, in my view, that was beyond despicable. Um, beyond despicable. Callous in the extreme to actually insult and smear survivors of an atrocity in that way. I saw it to a lesser extent when we suffered Islamist attacks in this country in recent years. Um, there are videos floating around, for example, claiming that survivors of the London Bridge attack were crisis actors. These people seem to come out of the woodwork when it's convenient, the, the conspiracy theorists, I mean. But that's an example of where it's not healthy, where it's not just asking questions of authority is being openly callous people who survived these things i feel that way about 9 11 truthers when they say that it's all made up or you know that they don't all fit into the same they don't all use the same narrative so someone was, will say yeah there was indeed a big attack um but it was an inside job but then you get things like well what about the the fake plane that was shot down and stuff like this to me, that is um, incredibly callous towards the uh, surviving family members. And they'll, they'll nitpick, they'll say, for example, they'll take audio of the airline stewardesses on those flights and they'll say, oh, well, they sound too calm for a supposed terrorist attack. Um, and hold that up as somehow evidence that it never happened, that there was no one on the plane or they were all actors, which I think is beyond despicable. Um, I'm not going to say that everything's clear cut about September 11th, but I, I think I would say this about conspiracy theorists or two conspiracy theorists. It's one thing questioning the government, but when you're actively trolling families, grieving families, I think that is just beyond the pale. I think it's repugnant. Uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, of course, gained notoriety for boycotting military funerals because of their extreme homophobia. Um, they were, of course, a cult, but what I find with conspiracy theorists, again, um, is that there is this, there's certain things that you notice. So one thing I've noticed is this cannot be pinned on the left or the right because you can find it on both sides. I would say most followers of Alex Jones tend to be pretty far right or at least well to the right. For example, with the crisis actors things, they tend to be militant Second Amendment advocates, often militia types, but not universally. Um, but then you get left-wing conspiracy theories as well, you know, where their whole thing will be, oh, it's all about American power. So they will actively serve as propagandists and cheerleaders for the Russian and Chinese regimes just because they're anti-American. My my answer to that is, it's not one or the other. I think it's possible to criticize American foreign policy or even be critical of American foreign policy without acting as an apologist for um, the Chinese or Russian regimes. And the thing is, sometimes you get individuals who were quite well respected and they were intelligent 
um, experienced individuals, but then for whatever reason, they started going down this rabbit hole of aligning themselves to some of these ideas. An example would be the journalist um, John Pilger. Now, he was a widely respected journalist, you know, years of field experience, uh, very hardworking, very tireless. In recent years, he has become very much... It's, it's become obvious that he's blurred the lines between investigative journalism and basically being a propagandist for the Kremlin. I want to see how it comes across to me. Uh, and there's other examples. Um, and that's troubling because when you get a respected individual, they can't just be so easily dismissed. And it's not because they're right. Um, I think he's dead wrong. But it's because when you have a reasonable voice, more likely you're more people are likely to buy into it. They'll think, oh, well, it's John Pilger. It must be true. So I think it's actually pretty despicable. And by the way, what I'm talking about is the fact that he has actively worked for Russian state-funded broadcasters like RT, and he has actively pushed and endorsed Kremlin's narrative on a lot of things. It's not a case of, oh, well, he's critical of American power, which, I mean, Pilger's always been to the left, but Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with um, questioning militarism or anything like that. But there is a problem with it when you are so determined to expose how evil America is that you will actively help to promote the propaganda of other powerful regimes. Um, that's what I find, frankly, despicable. Um, and we see this with Bashar Assad in Syria as well. You know, people so... And the an interesting thing about Assad and Putin, for that matter, is they get support from both the far left and the far right for different reasons. With the far left, the likes of the Stop the War Coalition, it's because they see only Western militarism. They see only NATO militarism. And they're incapable of acknowledging that there is other powerful players. Um, therefore, if NATO responds with force to a brutal dictator slaughtering his own people and raining barrel bombs on children. The Stop the War Coalition and pro-Assad conspiracy theorists will actively lie for him. They will actively say, oh, he's just the good guy fighting terrorists. I think that might be the biggest lie of the 2010s decade, in fact, in terms of scale, because it's been effective. Assad's got the upper hand. And when you look at the tentacles of Russian state media, which are pretty powerful. Um, you can see why people believe this. You know, the reality of a brutal dictator um, doing anything he can to stay in power, including ma mass murder, um, combined with vicious Islamists as well on the ground, that, that's the reality of it. The reality of the Syria war is there is a lot of um, factors involved. There is a lot of um, combatants. It's not a simple black and white thing of an embattled president fighting terrorists. And it's so, so grotesque that people spin it that way. But with conspiracy theorists, like I say, there is that colour side when grieving families are targeted. Um, so this thing where conspiracy theorists think that they're brave revolutionaries, you know, holding truth to power. Um, the other thing about them is they tend to be very arrogant and self-righteous. I mean, they think that they alone seem to know the truth, but the rest of us are idiots. Um, so I think there's an arrogant side to that as well. Um, what else can I say? I, I just think that whilst it's healthy to question power, it's not healthy to disbelieve everything just for the sake of it. And that's what conspiracy theorists do. Everything is a lie to them. Everything. And when they start believing this alternative reality to the point where they lose all rational objectivity, it can become dangerous when they're then promoting um, conspiracy theories against a particular group of people. And I'm not talking about governments. I'm talking about... Well, the example certainly of survivors of atrocities, um, but it's um, they they become useful. 
to actually become useful for the likes of Russia and China. And they always they always do it within the context of Western countries. You know, they're always doing on Facebook or YouTube or they'll be railing against the new world order, controlling all our brains. Of course, one of the most prominent ones this year is the the anti coronavirus conspiracy theories. That is to say, you know, it's all caused by uh, mobile phone technology or it's all a plot for population control you know the anti-mask people are a prominent example of this so I do think that uh, and that, that's dangerous because with them being reckless it puts the rest of it at risk so uh, I think conspiracy theories can be interesting I mean goodness knows I've watched plenty of documentaries about the alternative version of history it's interesting stuff it's undeniably interesting um but i think there needs to be some balance i mean i'll, I'll give an example of this um, bedtime stories is a channel i like a lot they cover a lot of interesting stuff they focus on the paranormal the supernatural but also they touch on conspiracy theories now what i like about those guys is they don't just come in with big sensationalist headlines like must watch new world order exposed or some nonsense like that they'll come in very objectively you know uh level tone of voice they're not being sensationalistic they're just giving the information that is available and letting the viewer decide for themselves because conspiracy theorists for all that they say they're trying to save the rest of us from the overbearing government they're actually very arrogant in terms of pushing their views on the others and if you question them, then you're, you know, you're, you're part of the establishment. But it is interesting that you can find this with the far left and the far right. I mentioned um, Assad. Well, the far left, again, would support Assad because they're, they have it in their head that, you know, the likes of the Stop the War Coalition have served as apologists, essentially, for dictators like Assad, because their so their sole focus is on demonizing the West and Western policy. Um, for the right, you know they uh, they see Assad as fighting Islamism, which he technically is, but that doesn't make him a good guy. Uh, I've even seen some right wingers defend China. Ironically, right wingers defending a communist regime. Because said communist regime, their victims in this case, the Uyghurs, happen to be Muslims. Um, but the thing about the Uyghur people, from what I've seen, um, I don't think they're particularly Islamized. I mean, the women don't all wear veils. Um, and it is interesting that ISIS hasn't threatened China in reprisals. So there's a lot of uh, talking points around that. Summed up. Um, when it comes to conspiracy theories, I really don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with asking questions or saying something doesn't quite add up about this. Because we do know from history that governments have covered up. We know that an organization like the CIA is incredibly powerful and they have engineered coups around the world and so on. So with the known history, I think it's logical and it's reasonable to ask questions and say well is that the whole truth the problem becomes when the conspiracy theorists just want to vindicate themselves they don't really care about the truth they just want to vindicate themselves so they will find any angle to distort anything to suit their narrative including being useful idiots for hostile foreign regimes that have no respect or dissenting views, I have no respect for a free press, I have no respect for um, human liberty. They will actually serve as apologists for these regimes. So that's another contention I have with certain conspiracy theorists, that they are hypocrites. Their whole thing is about freedom of thought and human liberty. You know, that tends to be the overriding theme, that they're all about liberty and about the stopping evil, you know, world order from controlling people and so on. Yet they, they will actively defend hostile foreign regimes. So I have more respect for the ones who may be critical of 
say the American government or the British government, that's fine, but they at least balance it with, okay, but we know or we're not going to serve as cheerleaders for the TCP. The problem is some of these people will actively, for example, try to pretend, try to imply that China is somehow a victim in the current situation. Uh, because, oh, it's just because the Americans don't want the Chinese to take over. Um, that's part of it. But they just totally ignore the fact that this is, in fact, a very brutal regime that has repressed a lot of people. And there's verifiable independent evidence to show that. Of course, they disregard evidence. So um, that's my take. Um, so just as a kind of disclaimer, I will not be endorsing it. If people leave comments like, Nathan, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Or rather, you know, trying to encourage me to endorse some of these ideas. Uh, I won't because I think they can be dangerous. I really do. I think they can be cruel. I think they can be, I think some people, when they go so far down that rabbit hole, they just, they're not interested in facts. They're not interested in evidence. They just want to vindicate themselves by just questioning everything. And that's, you know, that that's, goes beyond Fox Mulder. It's, it can actually be quite dangerous.